Everyone, this is the great Nikki Kendall. She is a feminist, an activist, a scholar, um, a powerful, powerful voice, and the author of this beautiful book, Hood Feminism. Look, we'll do double, we'll, we'll hit you with a double pile of it. Hood Feminism, yeah. <laughs> notes from the women that a movement forgot, um, which is all about the women who have been left behind in what we think of as the feminist movement, but um, a movement that is deeply, deeply flawed um, to a point that I did not realize until I read this extraordinary book. Um, and this book has uh, altered my thinking. It has changed my life's priorities. I would say that this is one of the most life-changing books I've ever read. And it's the second time I've read it. I read it last year. Um, I was so excited that you agreed to come on. I just read it again in the last few days. And um, oh, there's so much to say. So should we just begin? Yes. <laughs> yes. I've got like pages of documented questions and like this is the kind of book where if you can see how many pages I flagged in the book it's basically every other page um which it starts to get to the point where you're like why should I even continue bothering to flag the pages when every single page has significance on it um but I was wondering if we could begin um by asking you if you could read from the introduction of hood feminism um from pages 10 to 13 of the introduction i feel like this is a really good start for people who are just joining us um and again thank yes. you for being here it's so nice to see you face to face i'm such a fan okay oh, <laughs> i'm such a fan i really appreciate this okay my pleasure serious okay. writer reading face on okay okay well, come Become important feminist scholar now, and I will become <laughs> important public figure. Let's do this. <laughs> there still might be show tunes. My grandmother remains, despite her futile efforts to make me more ladylike, one of the most feminist women I've ever had the pleasure of knowing. And yet she never would have carried that label because so much of what feminists had to say of her time was laden with racist and classist assumptions about women like her, she focused on what she could control and was openly disdainful of a lot of feminist rhetoric. But she lived her feminism, and her priorities were in line with womanist views on individual and community health. She taught me that being able to survive, to take care of myself and those I love, was arguably more important than being concerned with respectability. Feminism as defined by the priorities of white women hinged on the availability of cheap labor in the home for women of color. Going into a white woman's kitchen did nothing to help other women. Those jobs have always been available, always paid poorly, always been dangerous. Freedom was not to be found in doing the same labor with a thin veneer of access to opportunities that would most likely never come. A better deal for white women could not be, would not be, the road to freedom for black women. She taught me to be critical of any ideology that claimed to know best if those espousing it didn't listen to me about what I wanted, much less needed. She taught me distrust. What progressives who ignore history don't understand is that just like racism is taught, so is distrust. Especially in households like mine, where parents and grandparents who had lived through Jim Crow, coins held for Reaganomics and the war on drugs, talk to their children early and often about how to stay out of trouble when the cops harassed you, but didn't bother to actually protect and serve when violence broke out between neighbors. Lectures from outsiders on what was wrong with our culture and community weren't what was needed. What we needed was the economic and racial privilege we lacked to be put to work to protect us. Being skeptical of those who promise they care but do nothing to help those who are marginalized is a life skill that can serve you well when your identity makes you a target. There's no magic shield in being middle class that can completely insulate you from the consequences of being in a body that's already been criminalized for existing. There's probably some value in being seen as a good girl and being someone who values fitting in and embracing the status quo. There are rewards, however minor, for those who value being seen as that middle-class model of respectable with no inconvenient rough edges. I've never found my way there, so I won't pretend to be able to detail the value or to judge those who can fit into that mold. I've just accepted that I never will, but I'll probably never even want to cut away the parts of me that protrude in the wrong directions. I like not living up to the expectations of people who don't like me. I enjoy knowing that my choices won't be acceptable to everyone. My feminism doesn't center on those who are comfortable with the status quo, because ultimately that road could never lead to equity for girls like me. When I was a kid, I thought there must be some way I could perform being good, perform being ladylike to the point of being safe from sexism, racism, and other things. After all, my grandmother was so determined to make it stick, it had to mean something. What I discovered was that it offered me absolutely no protection. 
that people took it as a sign of weakness and that if I wanted to do more than survive, I had to be able to fight back. Good girls were dainty and quiet and never got their clothes dirty, while bad girls yelled, fought, and could make someone regret hurting them, even if they couldn't always stop it. Trying to be good was boring, frustrating, and at times actively hurtful to my own well-being. Learning to defend myself, to be willing to take the risks of being a bad girl, was a process with a steep learning curve. But like with so many other things, I learned how to stand up when, even when other people were certain I should be content to sit down. Being good at being bad has been scary, fun, rewarding, and ultimately probably the only path I was ever meant to walk. I learned that being a problem child meant I could be an adult who went her own way and got things done because I am not so focused on pleasing other people at my own expense. My grandmother was wise for her time, but not necessarily the best judge of what I needed to do. She embraced middle-class ideas of being ladylike because for her, that was a path to relative safety. For me, it just left me unprepared. I had to learn on the fly from my community how to navigate the world outside the bubble she tried to create for me. I am not ashamed of where I come from. The hood taught me that feminism isn't just academic theory. It isn't a matter of saying the right words at the right time. Feminism is the work that you do and the people you do it for who matter more than anything else. Thank you so much. Um, I just got full body chills at that last line. Uh, I have it written down here too because it's so instructive. Feminism is the work that you do and the people you do it for who matter more than anyone else. How come I didn't know that? <laughs> you know, how come I didn't know that? I, I think of myself as progressive. I think of myself as, um, it was such an awakening to hear that line. And it's not how feminism has been traditionally defined. And it makes me feel like everything about the way we think of um, women's work for other women has to be completely and radically transformed, which is of course what your book is entirely about. <laughs> Well, and part of it is that we sort of get hung up weirdly in, I'll say girl boss, it isn't just girl boss, but like the girl power to girl boss to being a CEO kind of a thing, where we got so focused on getting power that we forgot what the power was supposed to be for. Someone said, please read that line one more time. So I'm going to say it one more time. Feminism is the work that you do and the people you do it for. Who knows? So I think part of this is honestly, this isn't me dunking on white women and, and our, our, our people uh, down through history. So much as it is, we got tied up in the narrative that so the American dream narrative in particular, that if you just had right. enough money, everything else would follow. Right. Well, in times of COVID, guess what we're seeing? That's not going to be enough. And, and the idea is, is almost that if we could have one woman representing all womanhood at the top of some field or industry or political system that was traditionally led by men, then we could all relax and we could say, look at the incredible gains we've made. Um, you know, look, there's a, there's a woman who's the, the president of this country. There's a woman who's the CEO of this corporation. There's a woman who's breaking through sports in this way. You know, um, yay, we've done so well. And what you're pointing out is the hundreds of million, millions of women who have been left behind as mainstream feminism debates questions about whether I should be working in the, you know, out of the house and leaving my kids to be raised by other people or whether I should be a stay-at-home mom when there are hundreds of millions of people who don't even have that, working out of the house and being a stay-at-home mom are not choices that they've got. Their whole um, fixation is on survival and none of those questions at the highest level um, of, as you say, granting more privilege to women who already had privilege um, are helping those who have been left behind. Um, right. And I, I want us to focus on basic needs and survival because ultimately if the system that we have keeps so many people at the bottom, right. keeps so many people, you know, in, in starvation cycles, basically, then we got to fix the system. It's not enough to have, you know, 3 million, 3 billion Four billion people, you know, the num the hunger stats are going to climb in the years, and especially this year. If those people don't have enough to eat, if those people can't stay home during a pandemic, well, we're in we're in the cycle, right? We've been proved nothing in the last hundred years, right? Uh, right, and if a smaller number of people get rich and a larger number of people are, it's no difference now than it was 
40 years ago. And one of the things that I feel like you blow up in this book and you, you express um, so vividly is the myth, the danger, and the trap of um, the whole idea of respectability. Some sort of a sense that, from what I understood of, of you speaking, that there's been a lie that's been told to women of color, which is that if you are somehow able to scrape together um, enough resources to appear respectable by white standards, which itself is, is out of reach for so many reasons um, in so many communities, then you'll be safe. Um, then you'll be, then your children will be safe and then you'll be included and you won't have to experience racism, you won't have to experience sexism. But the way you describe the trap of respectability is that, um, that is actually emotionally, psychologically, politically mm -hmm. traumatic um, to have to continue to try to uh, put yourself into this very narrow format of what is considered to be all right. Um, so could you speak about that uh, better than I just did? <laughs> I don't doubt that you can, but. <laughs> well, and one of the things is that respectability hinges on the idea that if you just follow some invisible line and you stay within these tiny, ever shifting boundaries, good things will happen. In reality, we know there's no perfect path forward for any of us in general, right? Before we get into race, to class, to anything else, bad things can happen to anyone. But then when you get into the idea that for people who are facing obstacles of racism and classism and all of these things, that you will somehow find the right path over those obstacles without ever offending anyone, without ever being angry, without ever in, infringing in any way on other people's ideals of what you should be, then, I, I mean, I'm an acrobat in my brain, but I'm not that kind, like Cirque du Soleil does not make people that talented. There is no way to go through those, those contortions and come out the other side. And so I wrote about it a little bit. I'm going to read just the TC to spit from one page. Okay. Yes, please do. And for those of you who are just joining us, because um, people are popping into the conversation, we're discussing the book Hood Feminism by Mickey Kendall. And um, she's about to read a section on respectability. And this is really important. So listen up, everybody. <laughs> It is that reliance on respectability that allows mainstream feminism to ignore those who can't speak in the tone that centers on the comfort of whiteness. The tone policing of respectability ensures that the fight for equality becomes the responsibility of the oppressed. It alleviates the responsibility of the powerful and the privileged to listen and to learn. It protects privilege by forcing marginalized people to calmly respond to injustice or risk their feelings being a barrier to resources. It renders even the expression of feminist issues an exercise in navigating privilege and having to earn your way to be able to critique, express anger or fear, or even ask for help. And it means that white-centered expectations of politeness, of muted emotions are projected onto the righteous anger and sometimes grief of women of color. Page 92. Respectability requires a form of restrained, emotionally neutral politeness that is completely at odds with any concept of normal human emotions. The emotional labor required to be respectable, to never ruffle anyone's feathers, to not get angry enough to challenge, much less confront those who might have harmed you, is incredibly onerous precisely because it is so dehumanizing. Respectability requires not just a stiff upper lip, but a burying of yourself inside your own flesh in order to be able to maintain the necessary facade. It requires erasing your memory of how it felt to be hungry, cold, scared, and so on, until all that is left is a plastic surface to mask the raging maelstrom underneath. Mm. We talk about stress and illness, but the stress of respectability is unparalleled. You muffle yourself over and over until the screaming is in your veins, in your high blood pressure and lower life expectancy. And then as you look around, you realize that you didn't even get the respect, the validation, or the comfort that you thought was waiting on the other side. You've pulled away from the messy, loud, emotional spaces that represent the less respectable side of you and your culture, but at what cost? And I, I wanted to make sure I highlighted that because often when we're talking about race and class and all of these things, we're talking about it as though they're all academic exercises, as though we're not talking about real people experiencing real trauma. And then we say, well, why didn't they respond better? No one in the history of humanity has ever responded well to Trump. Let us just get that out of the way. We None of us respond well when we're hurt. That's why we have panic and fear and fight and flight responses, because you're not supposed to respond to pain calmly. 
You're not supposed to be hurt and then make other people feel better. You're supposed to be able to get hurt and be able to seek help, be able to tend to your own wounds or have someone help you tend to your wounds. And even if these wounds are not physical, even if they're not immediately visual, emotional wounds that go untreated still can fester. We can still see people essentially bleeding out inside themselves from the pain that racism and other bigotry inflicts. And then we say, well, you're not making good choices. Well, you don't have any good choices to make. There's no good choices in the torture chamber. There's just pain. And if you aren't safe enough, or I don't even want to say the word brave enough, because um, to be brave enough to express your pain is to put yourself in a target of danger. Um, so once you start, you know, if you dare to express injustice, now, now you're actually putting yourself at risk. Um, so if you're, if you're not safe enough or the conditions aren't right for you to be able to do that and you have to keep eating that pain, it has to go somewhere, right? And so right. The, pain, the pain's gonna be internalized um, into into the body um, and 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 down through the generations in in the systemic trauma that gets passed generation by generation by generation people not being able to express their pain safely um, it's it's I'm so glad that you explained this to us and I also just want to point out to white women who are following this and listening to this um, this is why it is so extraordinarily important for you to not interrupt or criticize or God help you give suggestions um, to a black woman when it's your feeling that she's behaving too angrily. <laughs> um, you know, this is, this is like, just don't. <laughs> um, well, and the thing all is- All you're doing is saying, I need you to be more respectable because it's, a, it's offensive and frightening to me. Um, and, and, and what you're saying is, your pain is, is, is just too much for me to handle, so I'm gonna need you to put that away. Um, so please stop doing that. <laughs> well, and especially because, and I'm gonna say this as, as nicely as I can, if you can understand that when a white man tells you to calm down when you're upset, how offensive that is, if you can understand misogyny, I promise you, you can understand racism. And I know that you may think to yourself that this is not a racist act because it's not burning a cross and you're not using certain words, but if you can't stand the fact that someone is hurting and immediately feel like you should be reaching out to comfort them or to back off and give them their space, you've got to work out within yourself why them being upset is freaking you out. It is not their job to make you feel better. No more than you would feel like it was your job to make your sexist boss feel better when you finally snap on him and tell him about himself. Please do that more. I feel like everyone should tell their sexist or racist bosses about themselves and enjoy. <laughs> enjoy. Um, I wanted to say one of the one of the things that that really struck me about your book was um, talking about your experience of growing up as a very bright, very bookish young woman, right in the shadow of academia, right? Literally right in the shadow of the University of Chicago, one of the, the greatest institutions of learning in the entire world. And, and you wrote about how, you know, it was so heartbreaking to write about how close you were geographically to that institution and yet how the barriers to that institution were, were so vast and so um, prevalent, in, including um, students at that school being warned not to fraternize with people in the neighborhood, which was you, um, you know, to, that it's not safe. These are, you know, the sense that like these people in this neighborhood are not safe. You know, the school is a safe place and the neighborhood has no access to the school. And, and as somebody whose nickname as a child was books, <laughs> um, the idea oh, that, it, 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 <laughs> that you could have been this nerdish, you know, like somebody, one of those people who, um, absorbs every bit of knowledge that's available to her, um, even in a parched landscape, um, and that you could have been in the shadow of this institution, but not welcome to it. And then this devastating line that you wrote where you said about um, what was available to black people and people in the neighborhood at the University of Chicago, you said, um, getting a job as a caregiver, as a custodian, or in a dining room facility was relatively transparent, but as for ascending, um, accessing anything else, there was no clear path. Um, I, that, that might be the most devastating line of, of your book to me. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about that, talk about um, what, if anything, has changed in that since you were a young person and what path of education you ended up feeling like was a clear path for you, um, including the military um, as, as an option. And, and so um, over to you for that. <laughs> so one of the things um, 
college is expensive in general. University of Chicago's tuition is the equivalent right now, I would say, of a middle class salary. Um, it's a little over 55, I want to say. It might be 60 by now. They have these increases from time to time that just seem excessive. Um, and so one of the things about it, I'm sorry, I just realized we have the same cups, except I have the little round ones. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. These are the things in COVID conversations. Like, yes. what books do you have on your shelf? What cup, what sort of eyewear do you have? Um, anyways. <laughs> Go on yeah. with your conversation about the University yeah. of Chicago. <laughs> and so, um, you know, even when it came time to talk about going to college, right? I'm fin I, fin I graduated from high school when I was 16. And we were having the college conversations and college applications conversations at school. Um, and my guidance counselor, I said something about the University of Chicago. And my guidance counselor essentially looked at me and said, unless you have very wealthy relatives or you can get a really good scholarship, it's just not reasonable. And I had neither of these things. We'll put it that way. Um, I did get into some schools, but at 16, another barrier to me going to college was that no one wanted a 16-year-old in their dorms. No sane, reasonable institution really wanted to deal with 16-year-old girl, college dorms, no parental supervision. It was the 90s, but it wasn't that much of the 90s. And so I got a job at a mall and I tried to figure out what I wanted to do. I wasn't gung-ho to stay at home and go to college. I wasn't gung-ho to go and live in whatever weird construction we could have come up with. Um, and meanwhile, I was going back and forth. I was all over the campus. I was all over all these other campuses. And ultimately, I joined the military because the recruiter that came to my mall job, I had a job at the mall, uh, mentioned that you could get four years to tuition-free in any state school. And the state school I had by that point held on um, was University of Illinois. But University of Illinois was also still, even though it was far cheaper, it was also still more expensive than I reasonably thought I could afford or that my parents would be able to pay for, my family would be able to pay for. So I joined the military and it was great. And then it was not great because I blew out my leg and I got a medical discharge and a bunch of other stuff. But along the way, I started to understand, just because I went to Germany and all these other places, that in other countries, college did not require this sacrifice. There was not the same barrier. Even though Cambridge and Oxford are so famous and you really have to study and all of these things, finding out how much we spend on college access versus literally everywhere else, where even right now, a, a top tier school in England costs less than a state school in America. I started to really understand that there was a lot of pitfalls along the way, that the only way to do this was what I was already doing was not just the GI Bill, but use what my state has, which is called the Illinois Veterans Grant, which is what meant I could go to school for free, get my bachelor's for free. Even with that, I still accrued some debt in undergrad, but University of Chicago at that point, they were not interested in being part of any of the veterans programs that have since come into play in private institutions. Um, a lot of private schools, really until the second version of the GI Bill, the most recent post 9 11 GI Bill, weren't interested in having veterans on their campus who weren't already wealthy, who weren't already connected, who weren't already. Sure, there were some scholarships, sure, you could find some things, but overwhelmingly, a top-tier education is simply not available even after you have served. And it's not that I think veterans should be on some higher priority than any other student, but we can't say as a culture that we want people to be educated and, and contribute and then say, if you're poor, good luck. It's six figures of debt to get to that education. And by the way, you may or may not get a job that ever lets you pay that debt off. And University of Chicago is now brought in scholarships that give a, a full ride to graduates of public school. But that came into place four years ago, I want to say maybe five. It is so recent that my child, who was a college student, was in the first year of eligible graduates from Chicago public schools. It is just that recent. He's not even graduated from college yet. He's a, a senior. Right. So we can't I often feel like when people talk about the academy and, and, and everything attached to it, you can't be in an ivory tower and make decisions for people who you won't even open the door for. 
right. and expect them to listen to you or believe that you care about them because there's no evidence that you care about their future. Right. And when you, and, and when you said that, um, so what comes out of that ivory tower is policy um, mm -hmm. and, and uh, future leadership, um, business leaders, political leaders, and feminist thinkers and 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 you know all of it's coming out of that academy and as you said so many feminist texts were clearly written about girls like me instead of by girls like me um mm -hmm. i want to ask you what um when you spoke about uh, by the way everybody if you're just joining us we're talking about this extraordinary book hood feminism by the great mickey kendall um so you've written you've written the book that wasn't available for you when you were yes. in um, and, and I wondered what the reaction has been within mainstream feminism. And I also had a question, is it fair to just call mainstream feminism white feminism? Because I, I feel like, is that what it really is? Um, because it feels like I, it. <laughs> it. Honestly, <laughs> yes. You just and I, I, I waver slightly because I will say that for low income white women, I know they get low income white people get hit with the racist tag a lot. And I'm not saying that there are no racists in the lower income circles. But in my experience, the most bigotry has not come from the people with the least money. They don't have the power, financial or otherwise. They can benefit from white privilege to some degree, but by and large, they are not insulated enough to enact oppression in any major structural way. And so, but yeah, it is. It is basically mainstream feminism is in conversation with itself about the things that I say. The best reception has largely come from people who we are often told do not read, right? Hairdressers, um, sports figures, barbershops, singers, the people who we will say aren't interested in learning or don't want to learn are saying, this I can understand. Because I always felt really uncomfortable with the idea that you needed a master's degree to understand the texts that were supposed to be talking about people who didn't have the same access to education. I didn't write this to academics in the sense that it was about their respect or their response so much as it was for people who are finding these texts. I wanted them to feel like they had a voice in this place, that the people in this place in writing policy and whatever would not be able to say that they didn't have a way to speak for themselves. Right. Right. I don't expect this to be the last book like this. I expect it to be criticized. I expect more people to write more books like this, hopefully, because fundamentally in that place where there are women like me, there are also trans women. There are women who have different experiences, who are indigenous, who are all these other places that they go that I don't, right? Identities I do not inhabit. And their voices matter. Their experiences and their needs matter. And we're not currently in the body of feminist lit really creating a lot of space for us to, to listen, to hear from people who we want to then say, well, this is what will help you. Let me write policy for you. Right. And this, and this shows up a lot, especially when it comes to policy around hunger and food and that kind of thing, because people who have never been hungry really will write a food stamp budget that works out to $1.57 a meal. Dollar sixty-seven a meal, and then they don't understand why that's not enough. In, in addition and, to maybe suggesting that you should be pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and making better choices. <laughs> and I'm going to point out one more time that the only thing you can pull up by a bootstrap is a boot. You can't even pull your own foot up by it. You can pick and, up and shoes. You, you said something so moving in this book about how consistently. Um, the most generous people are those who have the least. Um, this has also been my experience in life. Um, I've been around people who have a very great deal and who are terrified of giving, um, terrified of giving, terrified of sharing, um, terrified that anybody else's gain is their loss. Um, I mean, there's a real toxic capitalism at play in a lot of people where uh, there's a sense that, um, yeah, there's a there's a, a, a terrible sense of, of loss of privilege, and and if, if if I give if if anybody else gets anything, then I and I lose. Um, whereas uh, you know everyone who's ever ridden the subway has seen this in New York City. I've seen this again and again and again that when homeless people are begging in the subway, 
it is people of color who are giving them money. It is um, people who don't look like they have a lot of money who are giving them money. It's the guy in the suit who's turning his face away in contempt. And I think so much of that is about the the person of color, the the person who doesn't have much recognizing how thin the line is between having a home and not having a home, um, how easily this could be you, um, you know, how, how close they're living to the bone, a real empathic understanding of what hunger feels like, um, what poverty feels like, what eviction feels like, hunger, eviction, poverty, education, um, housing, gun violence, all of these get their own chapter in your book as issues that need to be put at the forefront of any conversation about helping women. Um, and yet, this lack of generosity that I see um, is so prevalent in this culture. It's taught, it's fetishized, it's now embodied by the person currently sitting in the White House. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a disease of its own. And I wondered if you would speak about what you think the definition of generosity is, um, what your experience is with it, and what you think has, has happened to poison the groundwater where so many people simply cannot access that in themselves, not even to have the generosity to listen to somebody with a different voice than theirs. So I will say this, that in a, in a, in a curious way, greed, like extreme wealth, is really a hoarding disorder. Yeah. And we don't talk about it as a hoarding disorder, but there's not really a reason to have $900 billion or $90 billion or whatever. Materially, your life is no better or worse and your access to whatever is no better or worse at, at 100 million, right? And this is still a crazy high number, as it might be at 1 billion. And never mind when we get into the other more esoteric numbers. And fundamentally, we've now reached the place where everyone is sort of playing hungry, hungry hippo with resources. Mm. And I got to get the most. And then when you say, well, what are you going to do with it? They've never thought that far. They're so locked into the competition. And we see it, we've seen it sold to America, and not just America, but especially I'm going to use America for this part of the example. When Ronald Reagan had the whole welfare queen narrative, right? And he told right. people about this woman in Chicago and she's doing all of these things, and he paints this image of someone living high off the hog of your tax dollars. It was all a shill to cover the fact that your tax dollars really aren't going back to you. And they're not being stolen by this you know, mythical woman who, side note, the woman that story is based on was a white woman who was a con artist who committed a, a host of crimes having nothing to do with welfare as well as that. Her name is Linda Taylor. There's a whole book about her. You can read it. It's fascinating. But she's not a person. It's the most outlier of outliers. It's like saying that you're going to base policy on Ted Bundy. Right. Right. I'm going to base my policies around a serial killer. That doesn't make any sense. And so... Really, though, it's a it's the three card Monty game because the people who tell you the most that being generous to your neighbors is bad for you are the people we just saw get rich in the middle of a pandemic. Right, they're the people who have been robbing you blind in the interest of pet projects that conveniently their aunt, cousin, whoever owns the construction company, right. who are walking off with the shop, and then they're telling you that the scarcity that you experience, which may be real, is because of those people over there taking it from you. And it's the best misdirection. It's, it's, it's a con. And so then when you say, well, I'm not going to give homeless people this money. I don't want people to have on food stamps to have more than I do. We have a military budget that if we cut it in half, would pay for all of those services and more cut it by three quarters and we wouldn't be having these conversations about people's ability to stay home through the pandemic or through anything else. You quite literally are paying tax dollars in to get nothing back. And the fine example of that came out when they told you that the federal stockpile didn't belong to the people who paid for it. Right. Right. And so we think somehow that the lack we experience is about our neighbor. It's not your neighbor. Right? It's quite literally the people who are supposed to be public servants and other wealthy folks who have bought and paid for those public servants gathering together as they manifest, for a lack of a better way of putting it, this peculiar hoarding disorder because they want all the cash in their pocket. They literally have a Scrooge McDuck thing going on with less 
compassion, which is a strange thing to say. I recognize that. But yet, Scrooge McDuck would actually be more generous. And they are convincing themselves that somehow this money will insulate them from the consequences. Hence, why we have people saying, well, our, biz our economy has to go back to business, send your kids to school, go back to work, because they're afraid of losing money for even a few days. Not that they're at any risk of going hungry, not that they're at any risk of anyone they know going without. You really don't need seven yachts or whatever else we've seen. But they're so busy playing the game with each other that every time you hear you shouldn't give money, that those people are taking from you, what you should think is the person saying this to me has their hand in my pocket. They're currently robbing me blind and they're doing the equivalent of picking my pocket and saying, that guy over there took it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. It's an, it's an actual, yeah, the, the hustle is, ma is really masterful. Um, yeah. And it works, I think. It's always worked in America because of America's delusional adolescent fantasy that everybody can get rich. And part of the reason that I think people, um, part of the reason I think people are so unwilling to bring in any program that might look like socialism, that might look like um, social democracy is because anytime the taxes go up, even people who don't pay high taxes don't want taxes going up because they still have a plan that someday they're gonna get rich. <laughs> and when that day comes, they don't wanna give up their taxes. And it's this mystery about, um, but, but this would benefit you now, but the thought is like someday, what is it? I can't remember who it was that said America is a country filled with temporarily embarrassed future millionaires. Like everyone yes. has got some dream that like one of these days they're going to hit it and then they're going to be a millionaire. And they don't want anyone taking their tax money then. So even people who it would really benefit to change the tax laws won't, won't get behind it because of this, um, this dream that we've been fed that seems to really keep people in their lane. Of right. Poverty. The streets are paved with gold, the land yeah. of milk and honey. And meanwhile, I'm going to point out that when COVID hit and beyond, the people you needed the most weren't the millionaires. The people you needed the most brought you groceries. Right. They drove trucks. They worked in stores. They delivered food. Those folks deserve to have enough to live on. And you can't run a city. This is my, my house city on the hill point out. We don't yet live in the age of the Jetsons, but if we did, you should think about what was below the clouds mm. on the on the Jetsons cartoons, mm. right? Mm. And why there was only a few people up there and why they needed robots. Because what we think we're going to have as a future and what we are actually having, it, it really right now we look more like the end of this ends in Snowpiercer than the Jetsons. Right. <laughs> I personally can I just, can I just give a nerd to nerd nod for you on those references? <laughs> just like, I thank you. <laughs> but yeah, and so we're, we're not a nation of champions. First of all, we shouldn't want to be a nation of millionaires, right? We, we really should probably think about what that would mean and who does the work and what we have. And also, we should really think about what does that mean as a meaningless thing. We get to the point, everybody has a million dollars, nobody has any food. Right, right. And the house on the hill, the whole house on the hill fantasy is wonderful, but I've met the people who live on the hill um, and they're not well, you know, they're not well. It's, it's, it, they're, they cannot get through the day or the night without medication and I'm not dissing medication. I'm just saying if your plan is that you're gonna be relaxed and happy once you have the house on the hill. I have terrible news for you <laughs> that, um, that it doesn't seem to work because those people are stressed as fuck and they are, and they are terrified and they're, sleep and they're sleeping with guns under their pillows and, and they don't know how to connect. Um, you know, what I, what I always wanna say when I encounter people like that is like, let me come and show you some stuff you could get involved with that is gonna make you feel your heart in such a way and feel your humanity in such a way that you're not going to need these barriers anymore. Um, you know, like, let me introduce you to some people who are going to inspire you so much that you're going to want to be part of their lives, that you're not going to see them as a problem. You're going to see them as a gift of, of untapped resources that you want to be part of, a transformation that you want to join. But, but instead, there's a sense of barricading yourself in that house on the hill and making sure that whatever else happens, nobody comes and, and takes yours. I, and I always think that 
when you really, whenever you see stories set in the house on the hill, mm -hmm. they're usually murder mysteries. Right. <laughs> it's not a rom-com in the house on the hill. It's a horror movie. It's a murder. It's a horror movie, which is the truth. You've, you've, you've isolated yourself so much that now you live in a nightmare. And that's, that, that is, and I've seen that again and again. I've been in those homes and there's, there's not much to envy there. You know, um, it, there, there really isn't. So what I always say is the system's not even working for the people at the top. They just, they're a lot more comfortable, but they're very anxious and they're very stressed in a much nicer house, you know, um, but this, but the whole culture is ill, you know, um, and, and that's, I hope is something that might be changing. So I wanted, I wanted to read this one thing that you said, speaking of change and transformation, um, you wrote, I could be any of the women we have seen brutalized or killed by police in recent years as videos proliferate. I have been verbally assault, abused by a police officer, threatened, harassed, but never assaulted. That's not a statement about who I am or how I engage. It's just luck of the draw. And later in the book, you also say, for black women, there is no officer friendly. And you speak really eloquently about what happens in gentrification, where um, when white people move into a traditionally black neighborhood, they start to see a presence of police as a sign that the neighborhood is safe. Whereas in the black community, the presence of police is a, is a sign of, of living under a state of terror. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering, in this very moment, you wrote this book, obviously, before this, this extraordinary moment that's happening in American history right now. And again, for those of you who are just joining us, I just can't push it enough. Um, this is an amazing book called Hood Feminism by the great Mickey Kendall. She's got her copy. I've got my copy. I hope you get your copy. <laughs> um, I, of course, I have to ask you, um, what your thoughts are personally, politically, about what's happening right now, um, and also what your hopes and fears are about the current movement. And do you think this is unlike anything we have ever seen? So a couple things. I'm going to point out that right now it appears that part of what happened to Breonna Taylor in Kentucky, she was the EMT killed in her home by a, a no-knock warrant wielded by police officers with dubious reasons to be there. She was in the area that is currently under gentrification. And we have to think when we talk about this, that the police are not going to be any kinder in areas under gentrification to the next wave of people. You move all the black people and brown people out and you still have a problem because rich people are still trying to get richer at the expense of other people. And I'm going to remind everyone of the French Revolution and the conditions that led to it, and the Russian Revolution and all the other revolutions. Because what happens before is what, in some respects, is happening here and now. Right. Massive wealth inequality, oppressive systems, abuse of power, and what you get is a population that has been told that their choices are death, fast or slow. That's it, right? And then you say to them, how dare you be upset about it? It's the most illogical thing I've ever seen. So if you want me to be upset about a Target or a Wendy's or whatever, I'm going to look at you and say, well, no one died. That's point A. Point B, yes, this is new in American history, kind of, again, because we don't really teach American history accurately. So I'm going to tell you, surprise, slavery was going to end before the Civil War regardless. The Civil War happens because politicians were trying to avoid the war, they didn't succeed. But America had, had over 100 slave revolutions. We have seen labor riots in America. We have seen civil rights movement. We've seen all of these things. You know why that happens over and over again in human history? Because ultimately humans get tired of being backed into a corner. Yeah. They do not respond well to oppression, okay? And sometimes I know people like to think that oppression could end if people would just ask nicely. If you can find me a moment in human history where oppression ended because people asked nicely, I am right here waiting to hear from you. However, I wrote an entire other book called Amazon's Abolitionists and Activists that talks a lot about the history of women fighting for their rights and along the way, people fighting for their rights. And I'm going to tell you, and that's a graphic novel, so like there's pretty pictures here. I'm going to tell you, even in my research for that book, at no point did I find a place where we could have an oppressive structure and people not fight. The difference here and now is that we would like to pretend that we were going to be on the right side of history at some other point. Whoever you are in this moment is who you would have been then. 
is who you are going to be going for. So you have a, a, a place to make a choice, right? Could we avoid things getting really bad in the guillotines, metaphorical or otherwise? Absolutely. We have the option. The question is not we're going to exercise it. Because the current occupant of the White House did not get there by himself. He did not get there because there were no other people who agreed with him. There are people who chose to vote for the racism who are now upset because they just figured out that the bigot doesn't care about them either. I hope you vote better going forward. I hope that we understand that this moment is where America decides her own future. Which way are we going? Right? Because we can go the way. I know people are going to say it can't happen here, and I'm going to remind you that you can look up Russia. You can look up Cambodia. You can look up literally England, Ireland, any place in the world you can think of and find the point where people said enough. And maybe they were successful and maybe they weren't, but that didn't mean they didn't stop fighting. This is a marathon. So I, I would hope we choose we, we choose not to get to like right. just say it would be great not to get to that point, but that means we have to do something now, not later, not when it feels more convenient, not when it's less stressful, but now because the pressure of the pandemic on communities that were already under pressure because of oppression, right, and you add in. I don't know if people have understood what they're seeing, so I'm going to say this. This is a detour from my book, but not really. You saw the police pepper spray a little girl in the face. You saw them knock an old man down and then look in the cameras like it didn't matter. You should probably be, be concerned about where we are as a culture that someone could calmly, under the cover of authority, hurt the people who look like you, even if they don't look like me. Right. None of us are safe. If none of us are safe, none of us are safe. There's a story that that has been coming to my mind a lot lately. Um, Years ago, um, uh, the brother of a friend of mine was a... um, was a police officer in Ohio, and he was a very idealistic kind of Eagle Scout um, who went into the into policing very naively um, with the idea that he wanted to, to serve the community and that this would be the nicest way. He was a nice man. Um, and he was very young. He was the youngest guy in the force. And uh, three years into, it is a small town in Ohio, um, three years into his service on the force, he confessed to me in tears. He said, um, I just don't know what to do. He said, uh, I have never met in my three years policing in this town, I have never encountered a criminal who terrifies me as much as my fellow police officers. He said, I'm afraid of them. I'm afraid of them. He's like, these guys are bad men. Um, they, are, they are criminals, they're violent, they doctor evidence, they're, they're racist, um, they steal, they lie, they're abusive. And he was the youngest guy in the force and there were two sort of good guys and then there were 15, it was a gang basically and Mm -hmm. it's like he's like i i I literally don't know what he's like i don't know how to handle this i'm he's like i'm frightened for my life and i'm a police officer in uniform um you know so so the if you think that this is only if you think that you're safe from this problem you're not um and and as you were talking i was remembering too that I, i remember being astonished um when i was stumbled upon a document years ago, I was researching something else, but I stumbled on a document that was transcripts of um, debates in parliament in 1772 that were happening in England, where half of the people in parliament were saying, if you don't start giving rights to these people over in the United States, we're gonna end up in a war with them because they're not gonna tolerate this and they don't deserve to be treated as badly as we're treating them. And the other half were saying, you know, put like show them the boot, like like we need to put the, they're, they're being disobedient, we need to come down on the, ha- you know, hammer them even more. So I had never realized that there was even a debate going on then. You know, it seems like all of history is sort of this, this debate between you have to start giving people what they deserve to be fully enfranchised members of society or else it's just, it's just not right. You just have to. And another section who's like, put them in a pen and control them. Um, and, and if they act up, then come down on them even harder. It's, it's an ancient debate. And I feel like, as, as you do, that we're standing at the crossroads of it. And I'm wondering 
like, do you have hopeful moments? <laughs> I'm, sorry, I'm begging oh. you to say yes for my own. Don't, don't, no, don't give any here's the thing. your own truth. But um. <laughs> it's not that I don't have hopeful moments. Let me, let me clarify. I feel like we're at a pivotal point and we have all the tools we need to get it right. And I hope right. that we get it right. Seeing there's a video, um, I think it was at the White House, a black boy is at the barricades and he comes across and he starts to go down on his hands and knees and the cops are coming and they're going to hit him. And I saw a young white woman run around in front of him and put her body between them and stand there. And the cops got confused, right? What, what do we do? Cause we, we can get away with this, but we might not get away with that. And I saw other people imitate it. So the kids are giving me lots of hope. The kids are, the kids are all right. Many the kids of them. Are amazing. Not all of them. <laughs> but many. Um, it is just that historically, I think we have often, not always, but often made the wrong decision and then had to go back and revisit it. Right. Right. So the civil rights movement that could have gone a totally different direction. It was headed that way. Right. I know people think of Watts and other things as bad, but what politicians in the moment saw was that people were fed up and we could have more or we could make some progress. Did we make enough progress as a separate conversation, but they chose to make progress. This is a place where we can choose to make progress, and I hope that we do. It's just that there's currently a bloated tick making decisions, and I would like us to stop letting it make decisions and choose something else as a leadership situation. Yeah. And so that's where I have hope, but I have concerns, right? Well, you have to because some, some historically, thinking come in, yeah. but yeah, yeah. Historically, power doesn't give itself over very lightly. Exactly. <laughs> it just it tends to hold on with white knuckles at all costs, and um, you know, just I hope that there's enough of a democracy remaining that, um, it, which is itself another conversation <laughs> about voter just disenfranchisement and elections and. Um, I want to go back to something personal in your book that I was really moved by. Um, I loved the chapter in your book called The Hood Doesn't Hate Smart People. Um, I've never read anything quite like that. And, and it stands, um, so for those of you, again, who are just joining me, let me do another plug. We're talking about hood feminism with the great Mickey Kendall, um, a, a really beautiful book that is both personal, political, trenchant, um, extremely important for our times. Um, it's about feminism, but it's also about, as uh, Dr. Brittany Cooper said here a, a couple weeks ago, you know, a real call to become a better person than you ever intended to want to become. <laughs> you know, this is, this is what needs to happen right now across the board is that a lot of us need to become a better person than we ever intended to become. Um, so hopefully that, that's a movement of, of, of morality in addition to everything else. Um, but you spoke about being a, a bookish nerd girl in, um, in a, a really, in a neighborhood that was, that was very underserved and, and very poor. And I've read that story before, but, but it's often been told as, um, you know, that's the girl who's going to get bullied. That's the girl who's um, going to be um, misunderstood by her family, held back by her friends and community. She's going to have to cut off all ties to those people who are holding her down. You told such a beautifully different story of what your experience was with being um, a little girl nicknamed Books in a neighborhood um, where people were doing almost anything they had to do to survive. And um, I just wondered if you could share that because it was, I think it's really important um, for people to hear the story told this way. Um, I'm going to say this. I would not be where I am today if it hadn't been for my neighbors, if it hadn't been for everyone from the folks at the corner store who, side note, always knew my grades because the hood looks out for you, right? I could walk home from school, and by the time I got to my grandmother's house, she knew everywhere I had been along the way because someone would have called, they would have told her, whatever. But also, even though my grandmother dressed me funny, let me just tell you that I was the girl in, like, the pinafores and the ugly shoes. You all know the shoes, like, big pink Knock off shoes. I love how you described like you basically were dressed as if you were going to your first confirmation, like all the way into middle school, <laughs> high school. <laughs> and and it was it would be so funny because the same girls, and I won't say I was never bullied, but we all were bullied because we were 
kids and kids are atrocious humans. They're learning how to be people. Um, but it would be teasing, right? Those shoes are ugly. Girl, what are you wearing today? Right. Um, at one point, my eyebrows grew in before the rest of my face. So it was like, what, what is happening here? <laughs> the caucus. It was, it was a whole situation up here. It was just like caterpillars waving. Um, and, you know, I could have taken that as like, oh, they're so mean to me. But those were the same girls who not only taught me how to take care of my eyebrows, they taught me how to dress. They taught me how to code switch. They were, when someone actually was bullying me, when I actually was really, you know, getting it, they were the girls who showed up not just to fight for me, but to teach me how to fight. Mm. It was never a situation where I was in some, they weren't, no, nothing that happened was unforgivable. It was loving. It might have been rough sometimes, but it was always loving. It was always, girl, if you are going to exist in the world, you need better skills than the ones you have. Right. right. As much as my grandmother wanted to keep me in a bubble, anyone else could see that that wasn't going to work. Right. And it was always, let's make sure you know how to navigate what you're doing, what you want to do. I was in the spelling bee, academic bowl. I went to every nerd tattooed thing, right? Comic books, all of that. And those are some of the girls I still talk to today. I have known them since I was three years old. And they still call me books, still tease me, but you will find no one who is prouder of me, no one who is more supportive of me than my community from when I was a kid, right? I, this book made it to the New York Times bestseller list. Literally the day it happened, I didn't even actually, don't tell my editor this, I didn't actually find out from my editor I found out from a girl I went to school with. Oh, I love that. She saw it, and books is on the list. Oh, 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 right? There's a Facebook group. There's all of these things. So to me, it's always been peculiar to think that being poor and smart meant that you had to pick one or the other. Because mm -hmm. I, they're nurses. They work in, in stores. They have all kinds of jobs, right? We were kids who came from not a lot, and some of us didn't make it, but the ones who did, we always look out for each other as best as we can. We still donate back to our old grammar school because we understood that this was a place that let us become great. Heck, my old math teacher found us on Facebook to give us all her photos from our class because she still had pictures of us you know, that she uploaded. Side note, there were some awkward bangs. We're never going to talk about them ever again. I, well, may I, ask you to, I may ask you to just silently slide me a, a picture of that later, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but this was the thing. Yeah. Yes, we were poor. Yes, we didn't have much. Yes, there were guns and drugs and all of these things on the periphery because that is poverty in America. But we also were loved. We were supported as best as they could. Right. We were taught that we were going to have to work twice as hard to get half as far, yes, but also that we had to work together, that the enemy was outside, so to speak, not inside. And the enemy wasn't even a person. It was racism. It was poverty. It was all of these things. And you can't fight those major things by yourself. And it was wonderful for me as a person to, even now, to look back and think about how different it might have been if I hadn't had that. How I really might have slipped between the cracks because the kids who don't slip between the cracks, the kids who make it, and I'm one of many, right? We don't make it by ourselves. We don't make it because we're exceptional. We make it because the community helps us and the community tries to help all of us. But no community lacking resources can get every kid what they need, but they right. can push as many forward as possible. There's a line that I love where you said, no one was coming to save us but us. Yes. Um, and, and that, like the way you just described it, just feels like it's, it's the embodiment of that. Um, and um, we're running out of time. We're about to wrap up. But I wanted to, speaking of people coming for each other um, and not in a negative way, like coming for each other, showing up for each other <laughs> is probably a better way to say it. Um, the last chapter of your book is about allyship, um, being an ally versus being an accomplice. Um, 
and and I wondered if you could describe what the difference is in your mind between being an ally and being an accomplice. Um, I have a feeling that 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 scene that you just described of the the young white girl putting her body between a young black man and the police is probably much more accomplice than, <laughs> than yes. ally. Um, yes. That's definitely not optical allyship. That is like boots on the ground allyship. Um, but I wondered if, um, if you could describe uh, what you think of as the difference. And then I've got one more question for you before we wrap up. Um, and once so, again, everybody, we're reading Hood Feminism by Nikki Kendall. <laughs> so um, allies, and there's nothing wrong with starting out trying to be an ally. Allies right. are supportive often from the back. They often are not between you and the danger. And sometimes they're just basically emotional or, or social cheerleaders, right? So allies might say, oh, this is bad, and reblog a black square, let's say, on, on Instagram. But an accomplice donates to a bail fund. An accomplice shows up at those boring meetings that they have about by school bond funds, police bond funds, all of those things, and they argue against giving more funds to harmful systems. Accomplices show up not just to say, yeah, go you, I fully support your struggle. They get in there and fight too. Right. And sometimes that's arguably more important than being an ally. And there's nothing wrong with being an ally in theory, but we, we found that we have a lot of allies that don't have enough accomplices. Right. Okay, so if you were going to give some action items um, that uh, a person who likes to define herself as an ally and is interested in moving into the role of accomplice. <laughs> what might some of those action items be, both on the um, personal level, on the uh, on the political level? Um, that would be amazing if you could offer yes. some of that. So uh, let's say you are in an area where there is currently a conversation happening about police in your schools. You don't want cops in your schools. They don't make anyone safer. And in case you think that somehow they will protect your kids in the moment of gun violence, I hereby refer you to the officer at Park when the school shooting happened in Parkland, Florida, who waited outside until the shooting stopped and then went in. So you're not doing anyone any favors by advocating for more cops in schools. Let's start there. Um, on a mundane, petty, personal level, you know, it could be as simple as speaking up when you see that Bob in accounting is consistently being racist to your coworker. It could be speaking up about that teacher at the school. It could be, you know, mutual aid funds, donating the bail funds, um, talking to Aunt Susan over that raisin-laden potato salad about her behavior and how she talks about people. On a more structural level, you should be asking politicians who want your vote what they're doing about these issues, right? Ranging from hunger to housing to homelessness to, to whatever, and pushing them to do the right thing. Not just to do the thing that said, because well, they're going to tell you something about the middle class. Side note, all of America is not middle class. So they're going to tell you, well, for mid our middle class voters, we're going to blah, blah, blah. What, ask them what they're doing for poor people. And ask them to make sure that poor people have their basic needs met. Right? And I say that that way specifically because they're going to listen to you more than they're going to listen to poor people. It might mean that your property taxes go up a whole hundred dollars a year. But if your property taxes going up a whole hundred dollars per year means all the kids in your district get to eat breakfast and lunch at school, I feel like that's a pretty good trade, personally. Yeah. You could maybe also push them, you know, to do things like defund the, the police. I know someone's gonna say, but we, we need officers for whatever. I'm going to tell you to go look at your school, your local budget, right? Your school budget and your police budgets and whatever other budgets for your area. And then look at that percentage and think about where that money could be better spent on the community. Because crime prevention in America never comes from giving cops more money. Right. You know what it actually comes from? After school programs, um, violence intervention programs. If you want to make the world a better place, you have to put resources toward making things better for people with the least. Right. Crime is often the product of scarcity, not of just some willful decision, right? People have to eat. Survival logic is very different than the logic you have when your basic needs are met and now you want to make, move forward. I just wrote all that down. <laughs> If it looked like I wasn't paying attention, it was only that I was writing notes of, um, you know, what I have to do going forward. And, um, and, I, and I will. And I think, um, I hope a lot of us will. Um, 
So Nikki Kendall, you, one of the last, one of the things you, you've said is, um, you know, each one teach one um, and, and lift as you climb. And you have climbed so, so far and um, lifted so many uh, people, people that in so many different ways and affected so many people in so many different ways. And I am just grateful for your existence in the world. I'm grateful for your voice. I'm grateful for your gifts. And I'm really grateful that you took this time to speak with us today. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate you boosting this. This is really using your platform for, for hopefully the greater good. And um, this, is, this is part of that accomplished thing that I talk about. So thank you. Thank you. Take care, Mickey. And everybody, last push. The book is called Hood Feminism. It's by Mickey Kendall. Um, I've spoken about how important it is. I know sometimes when you hear somebody say that a book is important, it feels like homework. Um, I just want to add, and I should have said this sooner, this book reads like a dream. It is, it is so beautifully written. It's also a, a, a searingly personal memoir. It's a page turner. Um, you know, don't worry, I'm not giving you an assignment to read something that's, that's hard and brutal. Um, Mickey's got an incredible, accessible, fluid, beautiful voice. Um, you'll fall in love with her on the page. And um, I think that it will change the way that you see the world and hopefully the way that you act in the world. So thank you so much, Mickey. I hope I see you again someday. And, yes. Um, I really- Someday really we'll go back you. outside again. We won't be grounded. Yeah, so someday when we go back outside, be safe. And, um, and thank you so, so, so much. Um, you are an essential worker. <laughs> I really appreciate everything that you do. Thank you. And thank you again Bye. for having me on. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.